Chapter 1. The Body on the Beach When I heard how Makara died, I should have said no to Rick. But Rick, who's my agent, is a good storyteller. I often think he should be the writer and me the agent. The story he told me over lunch that day went like this. Two Sundays earlier, the 12th of January, a man called Michael Makara had been on the last ferry of the day from Woods Hole, Massachusetts, to Martha's Vineyard. There was a strong wind when the ferry left at 9.45pm and the boat was crowded. Makara parked his car below decks and then went upstairs. No one saw him alive again. The journey to the island usually takes 45 minutes, but that night, because of the bad weather, it was nearly 11 o'clock before the ferry reached Vineyard Haven. When the driver of a new Ford Escape SUV did not come to take it off the boat, some of the crew pushed the car onto the dock and then began a search for the driver. They did not find anyone. A police check showed that the brown Ford Escape belonged to Martin S. Reinhardt of New York City, a well-known publisher. However, when the police telephoned Mr. Reinhardt, he was safe in California. He said that he kept the car at his holiday home on Martha's Vineyard for himself and his guests to use. He told the police that several people were staying there at the moment. After telephoning the house, Reinhardt said that someone was missing, a man called Michael Makara. The next morning, a woman found Makara's body on a beach about six kilometers to the west at Lambert's Cove. The police took it to the little morgue in Vineyard Haven and then drove to Reinhardt's house to give the guests the news and to ask someone to come and identify the body. That someone arrived at the morgue in a police car, followed by a second car with four armed guards. Until 18 months earlier, he had been the Prime Minister of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. He was Adam Lang. The lunch that day was Rick's idea. He'd phoned me the night before. I'm surprised it hasn't been in the newspapers, I said, when we'd finished eating. It has, he said. Perhaps I had seen something, but I'd been busy working 15 hours a day for a month to finish my new book, the autobiography of a famous footballer. Why did an ex-Prime Minister identify the body? I asked. Michael Makara, said Rick, looking straight into my eyes, was helping him write his memoirs. And this is where I should have left him sitting at the table and walked out into the London street with the rest of my life safely ahead of me. Instead, I said, I don't know anything about politics. Adam Lang needs a professional ghostwriter like you, not another politician, said Rick. Reinhardt paid $10 million for these memoirs for two reasons. One, he wants the book finished and in the bookshops within two years. Two, he expects Lang to tell everything about the war on terror. At the moment, he's not getting either. Things got so bad around Christmas that Reinhardt let Lang and Makara use his house in Martha's Vineyard so that they could work without interruptions. But Makara must have been feeling the pressure. They found a lot of alcohol in his body. So was his death an accident? I asked. An accident? Suicide? It doesn't matter, said Rick. He worked with Lang when Lang was Prime Minister. He did research and wrote Lang's speeches, and when Lang resigned, Makara continued to work with him. Rick finished his coffee, then went on. Reinhardt's company is worried. They're holding a meeting tomorrow to choose a new writer. John Maddox, chief executive of Reinhardt Publishing, is flying over from New York. Lang's sending Sidney Kroll, his lawyer. There are going to be interviews. I'm not sure about this, I said. I've got other writers that I could suggest, but you're the best for this job, said Rick. Me? But this isn't my usual kind of writing job, I said. The money will be good, said Rick. The kids won't starve. I don't have any kids, I reminded him. He smiled. I do, 
he said. After leaving Rick, I went into the nearest bookshop and was surprised by how many books there were about Adam Lang. I bought several for research, then left the shop. The moment I got outside, I realised that a bomb had gone off. People were hurrying from the underground railway station at Tottenham Court Road. In a nearby shop window, televisions were showing a picture of black smoke coming from the underground station at Oxford Circus. Words running along the bottom of the screens said that a suicide bomber was suspected. It took me two hours to walk home. All the underground stations were closed and no buses or taxis were moving. It was six o'clock when I reached my flat in Notting Hill. Kate had already arrived and was watching the news on TV. I had forgotten that she was coming for the evening. She was my girlfriend, lover. (laughs) I've never known what to call her. I kissed the top of her head, dropped the books on the sofa and went into the kitchen to get myself a drink. When I went back into the living room, she was removing the books from the bag. What are all these? She said, looking up at me. You're not interested in politics. And then she guessed, because she was clever and she knew I had just had a meeting with my agent. They want you to ghost his book. It probably won't happen, I said. She hated Lang. I knew that. But if they offer you the job, will you do it? Before I could answer, there was a picture of Adam Lang on the TV speaking from New York about the bomb attack in London. What's he doing in New York? Kate asked, her arms tightly folded across her chest. Lecturing? I said. So he travels abroad and drives around in a bomb-proof car with armed bodyguards making lots of money from lecturing, she said, while the rest of us are left here to be attacked by terrorists, and all because of the stupid decisions he made when he was Prime Minister. She looked at me angrily. I don't understand you. All the things I've said about him over the past few years, war criminal and the rest of it, and you agreed. Now you're going to write his book and make him even richer. She got up and went into the bedroom to get the bag she brought on the nights she planned to stay. I heard her filling it noisily with her things. I could have gone in and talked to her, but I didn't. I continued to stare at the TV. Minutes later, she was gone. Chapter 2. The Best Man for the Job The next day, I arrived at the London offices of Reinhardt Publishing five minutes before midday. Roy Quigley was waiting for me by the lifts. How many other writers have you seen? I asked him. Five. You're the last. Roy Quigley was about 50 years old, tall, and wearing a suit. He was not a happy man. His work no longer interested him, but he was careful not to let his employers know this. I knew him quite well, well enough to know that he didn't like me. I have to say, he said as we went up in the lift, I don't think you're the right man for this job. His job title was UK Group Editor-in-Chief, which thankfully meant nothing at all. The man that made all the important decisions, John Maddox, was sitting behind the large table when we walked into the huge meeting room. He was a big New Yorker with a bald head. Lang's Washington lawyer, Sidney Kroll, a weak-looking man in his forties with a pale face and unfashionable glasses, was sitting on his left. Quigley introduced me to them, then said, And Rick Riccadelli, you know. My agent turned to smile at me, and I sat down next to him. I believe you know what we're looking for, Maddox said to me. So perhaps you could tell us exactly why you think you are the best man for the job. I'll be honest, I replied. I don't read political memoirs. Nobody does. But that's not my problem. It's yours. I've heard that you've paid $10 million for this book. How much of that do you think you're going to get back? Two million, maybe? You won't be happy with that. I turned to Kroll. And Lang won't be happy either. He doesn't want a book that nobody reads. Kroll was smiling to himself. Maddox was staring hard at me. Political memoirs sell badly, I continued. 
Everyone knows they're going to read the same old things that all politicians say. You've got to put in some feeling, some emotion. What Adam Lang really needs is an experienced writer like me. I can ask the right questions, get at the real man, the man with a heart, not the politician. What rubbish, said Quigley. This autobiography is going to be a world publishing event, not something for a celebrity magazine. There was silence. Then Maddox spoke slowly and quietly. I have hundreds of world publishing events that I can't seem to sell, Roy, he said. And a lot of people read celebrity magazines. What do you think, Sydney? Adam wants this book to be a success, Kroll said after a moment. He's very upset about Michael, but he's ready to work with someone quite different. We need the book finished in a month, said Maddox. A month, I repeated. We already have a complete manuscript, said Kroll. It just needs some rewriting. A lot of rewriting, said Maddox, looking at me. But Rick tells me that you work fast. Also, you're British, and the ghost has to be British, like Lang. But everything has to be done in the US, and the manuscript must stay in America, said Kroll. Martin let us have the house in Martha's Vineyard because it's secure. Only a few people are allowed to look at the manuscript. How soon could you fly over to America? Maddox asked me. It's Friday today, I said. I could be ready to go on Sunday? And start Monday. He looked at Kroll, then at me. The job's yours. Everyone was smiling except quickly. Before I left, Kroll gave me a bright yellow plastic bag. At first, I thought it was Makara's manuscript. But Kroll said, No, it's not that. It's a book by a friend of mine. I'd like your opinion of it. Here's my phone number. Quigley went down in the lift with me. There's something not right about all this, he said. Me, you mean? I said. No, before you, he said, and gave me a cold look. Then he went on. It's odd that nobody's allowed to see anything. And I met Michael Makara. He wasn't the kind of man to commit suicide. The taxi journey home took an hour and I had time to look at the manuscript Kroll had given me. It was the memoir of a US politician and was very boring. I had got out of the taxi and I was crossing the road to my flat when someone touched my shoulder. I turned, and immediately I felt as though I'd walked into a wall. In fact, someone had hit me hard. I fell to the ground, and suddenly the yellow plastic bag was being pulled from my hands. The next thing I heard was two people running away. I was in a lot of pain. It was a minute or two before I realized that a woman was helping me to sit up. She wanted to call the police or an ambulance, but I said no to both. Instead, I managed to get upstairs to my flat. Sometime later, I telephoned Sidney Kroll and explained what had happened. He was shocked but told me not to worry about the manuscript. It wasn't important, he said. He could get another copy. Rick phoned minutes later. Once more, I described what had happened to me. He wanted to know if I was okay and still able to leave on Sunday. I said that I was. Well, here's another shop for you, he said. Reinhardt Inc. are going to pay you $250,000 for the book. What? I replied. This book could change your life, said Rick. He was right. It did. Chapter 3 A Bad Book At Heathrow Airport on Sunday morning, I sat in the American Airlines lounge with a cup of coffee and a newspaper. A television was on in one corner, and I had heard the TV newsreader say the words Adam Lang. Suddenly interested, I listened. To begin with, the story didn't seem that important. Five years ago, four British citizens had been kidnapped by the CIA in Pakistan. The plan was called Operation Tempest. The men, Nasir Ashraf, Shaquille Kwasi, Salim Khan and Farooq Ahmed, who were all British citizens, had been taken from the Pakistan city of Peshawar. 
All four were moved out of the country to a secret place and tortured. Mr. Ashraf died during questioning. The other three men were later put in prison at Guantanamo for three years. Only Mr. Ahmed was now in prison in the United States. But now a Sunday newspaper was suggesting that Adam Lang had ordered the men to be kidnapped and given to the CIA. A spokeswoman for Lang appeared on the screen and said that he had no plans to make a statement about these reports. I called Rick on my mobile phone. He was sitting in the British Airways lounge not far away, waiting for a flight to New York. Did you see the news? I asked him. The Lang story? Yes, he said. Do you think it's all true? Oh, who knows or cares, said Rick. I don't. I've been thinking, I began. When I was attacked on Friday, they left my money and only ran off with the manuscript. Perhaps they thought I was carrying Lang's memoirs. Maybe Kroll gave me the manuscript to look as though I was leaving the building carrying Adam Lang's book. Why would he do that? asked Rick. Maybe Kroll thinks somebody in the UK is desperate to get it, I said. Maybe he was using me to see if it was true. <laughs> You're crazy, he told me. I could hear him laughing. OK, OK, maybe I am crazy, I said. During the flight to Boston, I picked up every Sunday newspaper I could find in the seats near me and read all that had been written about Adam Lang and those four suspected terrorists. At Logan Airport, there was a message for me on my mobile phone. I had to take a bus to the ferry at Woods Hole and a car would meet me when I got off the ferry at Martha's Vineyard. The message was from Amelia Bly, Lang's personal assistant. From the deck of the ferry, I watched the evening lights of Woods Hole disappear and thought about Michael Makara. At Vineyard Haven, a taxi was waiting to take me to a hotel in quiet, wintry Edgartown. It was an old wooden hotel and I could hear the sea somewhere nearby in the darkness. The girl at the desk gave me a message from Lang's office. A car would fetch me at 10 o'clock the following morning. My taxi arrived after breakfast and drove me out of Edgartown. After about ten minutes, we went down a narrow forest road to a closed gate. A security man appeared and looked carefully at my passport. He said, or I think he said, Welcome to the crazy house. Reinhardt's house was a long, low, modern building. There were a few other buildings next to it. Another security man opened the front door and checked the contents of my shoulder bag. From somewhere inside the building, I heard a woman with a British accent shouting, This is stupid! Then a door banged and an attractive blonde woman in a dark blue jacket and skirt came clicking down the corridor on high heels. I'm Amelia Bly, she told me. She was probably 45 years old, but looked 10 years younger. I recognised her as the spokeswoman I'd seen on the television news the day before. Unfortunately, Adam's in New York and won't be back until later this afternoon, she said. The same woman's voice sounded again. She was still shouting. Amelia tried to smile. I'm so sorry, she said. I'm afraid poor Ruth is not having a good day. Ruth? I had not expected Lang's wife to be here. Come and have a cup of coffee, said Amelia and then I'll show you where we work. All the bedrooms of the house were on the ground floor, she explained, with the living rooms above. And the moment we entered the large open sitting room, I understood the reason. The huge window opposite gave a wonderful view of a lake, the sea and the sky. Our office is in here, said Amelia, opening a door at one end of the sitting room. I followed her into a big study. There were two desks, one large, one small. A secretary was sitting at a computer at the smaller desk. Three of us work with Adam, said Amelia. Myself, Lucy here, the girl in the corner looked up, and Jeff the driver, who is in New York. He'll bring the car back this afternoon. There are also six security officers from the UK, three here and three with Adam at the moment. How long have you worked with him? I asked. Eight years. I worked with him in Downing Street, and I still work for the government. 
She unlocked a big filing cabinet and took out a box file containing the manuscript. You can't take this out of this room, she said, putting it on the desk, nor can you copy it, but you can make notes. You have six hours to read it before Adam gets back. I'll send a sandwich up for your lunch. Lucy, come with me. After they had left, I opened the file, pulled out the manuscript, and started to read. All good books are different, but all bad books are exactly the same. They don't feel true. Adam Lang's memoir was clearly a bad book. The facts were probably right, but the whole book, all 16 chapters of it, felt false. I quickly read the chapter called War on Terror, searching for words like torture or CIA or Operation Tempest, but found nothing. I had finished reading the manuscript by mid-afternoon. I put my head in my hands, and when I finally looked up, I saw Ruth Lang standing in the doorway. <laughs> is it as bad as that? She asked. I nodded. I'm afraid it is. Let's go for a walk, she said. A quarter of an hour later, we were walking along the windy beach with a security man following us. So how bad is it? She asked. You haven't read it, I said. Not all of it. Well, it needs some work, I said politely. But I've only got four weeks. <laughs> four weeks? You'll never get him to sit still for that long, she laughed. A few moments passed, and then she said, We stayed at Christy Costello's house in Mustique last winter, and while we were there, I read his memoirs. You wrote the book, didn't you? Yes, I said. Christy Costello was a pop star who had taken drugs, drunk large amounts of alcohol, then married a woman who stopped him doing both and saved his life. It all made a good story, and the book was my first bestseller. It was very well written, she said. So I said to Adam, this is the man you need to write your book. She stopped and looked at the sea, pulling back the hood of her coat and breathing in the sea air. She was more beautiful than she looked on TV. I miss home, she said sadly. Then why don't you go back to London, I said. She didn't speak for a while. Then she looked at me and answered, Because there's something not quite right with Adam at the moment, and I'm a bit afraid to leave him. Amelia said that he was very upset by Michael Makara's death, I said. When did Mrs. Bly become an expert on the way my husband feels, she said angrily. Losing Michael did make it worse. But it's more than that. It's losing power. That's the real trouble. And the TV and newspapers going on and on about the things Adam did or, or didn't do. He can't get free of the past. We can't get free of it. After a time, we walked back to the house, and I saw two vehicles outside the front door. A dark green Jaguar and a black minivan with darkened windows. A grey-haired man in a cheap brown suit was standing by the Jaguar. Hello, Jeff, said Ruth. How was New York? Busy, he said. I was afraid that I wouldn't get back here in time to meet Mr Lang at the airport. Amelia Bly came out of the house, speaking into a mobile phone. Yes, I'll tell him, she said. She looked at Jeff and pointed at her watch. I think I'll go to the airport, Ruth said suddenly. Amelia can stay here and... Paint her nails or something. Why don't you come? She asked, turning to me. I'll travel in the other car, Amelia said quickly. I can do my nails in there. And she snapped her mobile phone shut. Jeff opened one of the Jaguar's rear doors for Ruth, while I nearly broke my arm pulling at the other. It's an armoured car, sir, Jeff explained to me as we moved away. Bomb-proof. The minivan followed close behind as we came out of the forest and onto the main road. Within minutes, we were at the airport. A Gulfstream private jet was dropping down out of the sky. Myself, Ruth and Amelia and one of the security men went into the little terminal building. An Edgartown policeman was already waiting there. The private jet had the word Hallington written in gold letters on the side. After it landed, the door opened and two security men came down the steps. One came straight to the terminal building, the other waited by the plane. After a few minutes, Lang appeared. He looked around and saw us looking through the window of the terminal. 
He waved and grinned, then walked quickly towards us. We walked forward to meet him as he came in. How was New York? Ruth asked him. Great, he said. Hi, Amelia. Then he turned to me. Hello, said Adam Lang. Who are you? I'm your ghost, I replied. <laughs>